Remember when Jimbo versus Saban was going to be a thing? Welcome into Up to the Second College Football Season 2, Episode 6, presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. We want to remind you to have fun out there with Academy Sports and Outdoors. I am David Nuno, and she is Kennedy Smith, also known as Lavernia Smith. Hello, Kennedy. Where on earth did Lavernius come from? Just Isn't like, that is that Billy's real name? That's his real name, yeah. I, that is shocking to me. I'm totally To me, lying he's to just you. Bill Nye the... Are, I lied Are to you. Are you? Yeah. No, of course his name's not Lavernius. I don't know. There's only I'm, one Lavernius I'm that I've ever met. really gullible. Hey, he's they're gullible. Bill Nye the football guy. But I'm having a really bad week, David. Like a really bad week. A&M didn't play well. Yes, I know. I am avid fans of two teams, the Aggies and the Razorbacks, which is a contradictory statement in itself, but you just got to let it go because it's family ties. I've got family that went to Arkansas. So those are my two teams. Okay. okay. We're going to ignore two weeks ago that they played each other. But like this weekend, Saturday, 530 rolled around. I had to turn off all my TVs and go take a walk. It was a very hard weekend for me. Very hard weekend. but So it, we're looking to recover this weekend. We're in midweek. What are we talking about today? Today? Oof, I mean, what, do you, what are some matchups we're going to see? How do you think a and can recover? Yada, Speak yada, yada. Me. All right. So A&M, how does A&M recover? I don't know. I really don't have an idea for you. Uh, A&M's offense has been surprisingly bad because I did expect them to be better than last year. I thought they were going to be kind of good, and they haven't been. So that, that's a problem. Uh, if it's a battle of two backup quarterbacks, then they got a chance. They got a chance because they got a lot of talent, but they got to figure things out offensively. So that's been an issue. The game I'm interested in, though, uh, I am very interested in, let's see, uh, LSU. Uh, they got a big game. Uh, who do they got? Who do they have again? Cut this out. I forgot who they're playing. I don't know. <laughs> oh, LSU, Tennessee. LSU versus Tennessee. That's the game I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. LSU versus Tennessee. Uh, because I want to see what Brian Kelly does against a big-time matchup. I also want to see Hendon Hooker take on LSU. They've had this season where you think, all right, they're figuring it out. They're figuring out. They're pretty, they really are up to their ranking. But is the SEC taking a step back? We'll, we're about to find out. LSU trying to get that win. I want to see what happens. Well, we're going to talk all about those matchups and more. We've got a big show today. We have former Ohio State running back and also Texans running back Jonathan Wells. Also, we've got Pete Futek coming on, plus we've got a little bit of OB and David's buddy Raheel, He's along a- with some insiders from Bama and Georgia. So stay tuned. This is Up to the Second College Football. All right, our next guest played running back at Ohio State, of course, with the Houston Texans as well. And he loves watching his Buckeyes, and they've got a big one this upcoming weekend with Michigan State. Jonathan Wells joining us here on Up to the Second College Football. What's going on, Jay Wells? Hey, what's going on? How y'all doing, man? Doing well, man. So I'm going to ask you. I know you watch Ohio State. You love them. That's your that's your team. I want you to make a case for them right now. Why should they be the number one team in the country? Uh, to be quite honest with you, I don't get into all that number one right now. It only matters where you end at at the end of the season. You know what I mean? So I'd rather stay around two, three, four, five. You know what I'm saying? And uh, going into the, the Big Ten Championship, going into the playoffs, I like to be the underdog, you know what I mean, instead of the hunted. So I don't really care about that. But, I mean, we are playing great football right now. The offense is amazing. Uh, we're running the football. We're being able to throw the football all over the place. And our defense is playing much better than it has in the last couple of years. So uh, definitely times to be excited, but uh, we're still early in the game. All right, C.J. Stroud, tell me, is he the best player in the country right now? <laughs> I mean, it's hard to go against him. I mean, uh, everything's clicking so well. I mean, he's thrown for 1,300 and some yards, 70% passing, 18 touchdowns, two interceptions. I mean, he's been pretty much flawless this season. And coming off of what he did last year, um, he has to be in the top two or three uh, Heisman, Heisman voters right now. So uh, he just has to continue to get better and uh, work on some of the things I've been seeing that he did in the offseason. And uh, he should definitely be there at the end of the season. John, how much better is the defense this year? I know they made a change, obviously, and, and, and it's got a more aggressive approach. But how much better are they big picture? Um, I think they're a lot better. I think uh, definitely the linebacker position is playing a lot better. Uh my guy, number 35, he's playing great. Uh, Eichenberg, uh, he's playing excellent right now in the middle of the defense. The defensive line is playing well. Um, I would like to see us give up a, a few, a couple less big plays in the passing game, but uh, we aren't giving up many points. So at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. But uh, the defense is definitely trending in the right direction. So what does the Ohio State need to do to beat Michigan State? Uh, just do what we've been doing, run the football, uh, take what they give us in the passing game. And then those receivers, you know, they're so athletic. They have so much speed out there. They they just be able to go run over the top of the defense and make plays uh, as they will. 
And uh, we continue to run the football at the clip we're running. I think both running backs are averaging over six to seven yards a carry. Um, that's phenomenal for uh, Williams and uh, Trey, Trayvon Henderson. So uh, we continue to do that. It'll be tough for anybody to beat us right now uh, until, until we get to later in the season. John, I, I got to ask you, all right, obviously the Michigan loss last year still stings, but I want to go back to your game against Michigan, that legendary performance. It was 129 yards, three rushing touchdowns. I, I see a little bit of a smirk coming. So talk to me about that one. How big of a game? Uh, do you Just give me your memories of that one. Um, that's a huge game, uh, especially in the rivalry with uh, the Ohio State and the team up north. That game right there really changed the rivalry back into the favor of Ohio State because we had not won uh, up in Michigan uh, for 14 years. We hadn't won there since 1987 before my senior year. So we had been on a, a long drought. And uh, we were long overdue for uh, some good some good news up there. So offensive line played great, man. Shout out to them. And uh, we were able to get out to a 23 nothing lead and uh, hold on to that. Because I only played one play in the second half. I would have been well over 200 yards. So it's still a bittersweet moment for me. But we got the W, so that's all that matters. <laughs> all right. I got to ask a Texans question. That's your team. You got to tell me, do you still pay attention to them? And how far are they from figuring it out? How many years? Well, I'll be quite honest with you. I was disconnected from the franchise for years. Um, I just recently moved back to Houston a year ago. So this last year, I've been all in with the organization. I'm a brand ambassador for the organization. So I'm really just getting my hands back around, you know, what's going on around here football wise. Um, I thought that this, this early in this season, man, we could easily uh, have two or three wins right now. You know, we make one or two different plays, you know, uh, in, in, in crunch time. And we're looking at this whole season as a total different direction. So, but that's why this NFL is so tough, man. It's hard to win games. You got to play the full 60 minutes. And if not, man, you can, uh, people can come back and beat you. So uh, I think we're going in the right direction. But if, if it doesn't show up in the win column, you know, that's hard to say. Jonathan, man, great stuff. I appreciate you coming on. Let's talk about it uh, as we get cl closer to the playoffs, all right? Sounds great, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, our big game of the week was supposed to be bigger, A&M and Alabama. You know about the fireworks during the offseason, Jimbo versus Saban, top recruiting class in the country, supposed to go and do their thing there in Tuscaloosa. Alabama lost last year. They won it back. They're the number one team in the country, and A&M's coming off a couple losses too. So it sounds like just where we were a year ago, but obviously the uh, the scene does change. We're going to talk to a couple insiders. Tony Sukalis, the managing editor of TideIllustrated.com, joining us here. And, of course, my partner at, at TechSags, Olam Buchanan. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so uh, my understanding, and I didn't see it, is that uh, Nick did not make much of the Jimbo stuff in this offseason in this week's press conference. Jimbo didn't make much of it either. How much of it is in the back of his head, in your opinion, Tony? I think I, I think it's got to be in his head, and I think it's got to be in some of the, the, the players' heads. I mean, um, we, we talked to Jameer Gibbs. Um, and he wasn't on the team last year, but he, you know, I asked him, you know, how, how much of it's been talked about in the locker room just from your, your, your teammates. And he said, it's, it's, you know, it, it's definitely something for them. So I, I think it's in the, you know, on the minds of everybody in that locker room, whether it be Nick, whether it be the players, they're just going to not, they're not going to provide that bulletin board material. So, I mean, you could see they were really guarded. I mean, especially Will Anderson, who had said that he was going to address that this week when he spoke to the media yesterday. It was very much they were kind of like in the background telling him, hey, hey, tone it down, tone it down. Don't don't give Texas A&M anything to work with. So I think that I, I, you might not hear about it, but I do think it's going to be a, a, a big game. OB, I'd like to ask you the same question, but A&M's got bigger things to worry about, right? <laughs> A&M has so many things to worry about um, beyond – you know, things that were said among uh, between their coaches. A&M's got to figure out what they want to do offensively. Uh, what Who's going to play quarterback? Uh, what are you going to do at the left guard position? Are you going to keep rushing three? Uh, maybe that's a good idea if it's uh, Milrow playing quarterback this week, If or it's definitely a bad idea if you if uh, Bryce is able to play. Uh, A&M has more things to worry about uh, – within its own team than uh, anything outside that, that happened in the offseason. Tony, I asked an Alabama insider buddy of mine earlier, and I'm going to ask you the same question. Do you think if Nick Saban has the chance to run up the score on A&M, or I guess anybody, really, just beyond A&M, but you know, the, the, the example that was given to me is Auburn. He could have, but he didn't a couple years back. But he has beaten A&M by quite a bit. So considering all this, this fire from this offseason, if he can run it up, will he? 
I mean, to to a certain extent, he 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 usually takes the the breaks off around when they get to like the sixties. I I don't think he's ever hit seventy points at, at Alabama. No, I don't think he's going to do that against A and M. First of all, I'm just saying like what his mo is. Um, you know, I, he, he usually doesn't want to reach that 70 point mark for whatever reason. So when he's really blowing on an opponent, you can see he kind of like does everything he can not to hit that mark. But if he has an opportunity to drop, you know, 50, 60 points on AM, and I mean, if that happens, I just, I don't necessarily think that that's the way this game is going to get, you know, blown out. Uh, he'll probably do it. I don't think he's going to like go out of his way, but I, don't, I definitely don't think he's going to hold back, especially after what happened this off season. It, but that's, a, I, I think this A&M defense is, is okay. It's more so it, this might be like a, a 30 to seven kind of game. You know what I'm saying? Where I just don't know how a and going to get its points. So I, I, those don't look as much of a blowout or, you know, running up the score as some of the shootouts might look. Oh, and I've heard uh, from callers today that uh, a couple of them thought that the defense was actually the bigger issue because the offense is what it is. The The defense has been disappointing. I feel like on my list of, of things, defense is, you know, there are some issues, no doubt, but they got to fix the offense, right? Well, I think the offense is more glaring issues. Uh, you know, anybody could just look at the, at the uh, stats and say, hey, what's going on with the offense? And the answer is nothing. But uh, I think there's more – there's more problems with the defense than maybe you see uh, on the surface, you know, at, at first glance. Um, you know, the, the A&M is, I think, have five sacks in, in, in five games. That was a big part of their defense last year was the pass rush. Again, we go back to the uh, last year A&M was a, a four-down lineman team. They supposedly have a lot of really talented defensive linemen, but they're playing, you know, three. Uh, so that's – you know that's a head scratcher. The the secondary is 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 hyped up to be really good, and at times it's made some good plays, but uh, they've also been vulnerable to deep balls. We saw it last week uh, with a seventy five yard touchdown pass by uh, Will Rogers. So A uh, and M's had a terrible time getting off the field. They're, they're uh, I think they're ranked around ninetieth or something like that nationally um, in third down defense. So, uh, yeah, the offensive issues are, are very much a concern and they're easy to look at and point out. But um, I think the defense uh, may, may not be as, uh, as alarming, but there's definitely some issues there that have to get cleaned up too. Tony, I hate to be Captain Obvious here, but let's play the game of Captain Obvious. What is the game plan to limit the very limited offense that AM has shown is it really about just forcing them to throw and taking out a chain i th- yeah first of all it's it starts with taking out a chain i think both as a you know a, a passer it, or it's for the receiving game and through the, the running game I, th- I think alabama did a pretty good job against Bijan robinson earlier this season and that's kind of like you look at similar kind of back that can do a lot of things. I think Alabama did a good job of that, but that's something that they struggled with in the past. And I think that's something that they're going to have to do straight off the bat. And then after that, yeah, I mean, it, it, it might depend on the quarterback. I mean, you got one guy that runs a little bit better and, and one guy that, that doesn't Al- Alabama's kind of struggled a little bit against running quarterbacks. Um, you know, uh, KJ Jefferson moved the ball. He's kind of a different quarterback, but you know, like, that you know that might be something that you know they they have to contain but in in terms of really just like limiting a and m's offense it stop it starts with with a chain if they can do that that that's the biggest way that a and m can can hurt alabama is maybe you know getting back to that you know mismatch problem that's caused alabama um some some you know headaches in the past i mean a and m's taken advantage of that with with you know passes to the running backs the last time that they were in tuscaloosa um, you know, I think they had a, they had a few, a few of those. So that's something that I would circle. Um, but that, that being said, I mean, this Alabama defense, I, I know they didn't have a great third quarter against Arkansas, but other than that, they've been really solid. Um, and I just don't see the way that a and is really moving the ball, that they're going to be able to do too much against this Alabama defense. Olin, what does A&M do if they do try to take out a chain? Where do they turn? Cause there really hasn't been a lot of options. Well, they haven't been able to turn anywhere, really. I mean, the offense has been Devon A-Chain and Anaya Smith, and Anaya Smith's no longer there. Now, Moose Muhammad uh, filled in nicely last week, and I'm sure that you know, that when they throw, 
uh, he'll be a guy that's going to be instrumental in that passing game along with Evan Stewart. But Evan Stewart has to uh, show that that more consistency. I mean, freshmen are obvi- uh, often inconsistent. But once you get past Devon A-Chain uh, and with, with Anais no longer available, um, you really can't find anybody that's been consistently good. Uh, and you have Haynes King is probably the starter, and he does give you – in theory, the uh, the running threat from the quarterback position, except that he's been hesitant to run this year. It almost seems like he doesn't want to. So um, is is that going to continue to be an issue? Really, A&M's offense is going to be built around uh, any success that Devon A. Chain has and then trying to throw off uh, play action. And unless A&M comes up with some new wrinkles – and some new looks. Maybe A chain will be used as a as a wideout in some situations. Then, uh, unless they do something like that, um, I really can't think of a reason to believe that they'll be any significantly more successful offensively. Tony, so last year I think the game plan was kind of the same. You limit Isaiah Spiller and A chain, but A and M came out throwing. Right? They, they they threw the ball quite a bit. Zach Calzada actually had a really nice game. What does Bama have to do to avoid what happened last year? And I know the Kyle Field magic isn't going to be traveling, is going to be there in Alabama. Right. I, I believe that they didn't a lot. Like, I don't think Will Anderson got a sack in that game. Um, but, you know, if, if they're able to kind of like limit the, the pass rush and, and give their quarterback, you know, whether it's Hanks King or Max Johnson, like whoever has the chance to, to, to maybe throw the ball, maybe let some plays you know, develop. I think that's going to be very key because um, if you let this pass rush swallow you up, I, you know, especially because I think they're going to, they've done such a great job of stopping the run, uh, you know, that they rank, uh, I think second in the nation holding people to like two point something yards per, per carry. So if you, if you stop them on the ground and, and really force these quarterbacks, neither one of them have been convincing in, into long situations and you can get pressure on them. I think that's when it gets really ugly. So if they can get, if they can kind of, it's a big question, right? It's a, it's a huge task, but if they can kind of limit Alabama's pass rush, I think um, that that's gotta be key number one. Um, and then you can maybe hope for some plays, you know, maybe hit them, hit them deep. I, Kool-Aid McKintree has been someone at cornerback that's really came on strong, but you know, um, I, I think maybe you, you attack them and, and maybe you can get some plays. Um, it, it's really kind of hard to, to, to figure out how you would break down this Alabama defense, but if you could eliminate the pass rush, that'd be a huge first step. All right, Olin, I'll ask you something pretty simple. Bryce Young, let's say he doesn't play in this game. How much of a chance does that give A&M? Because they probably will be on what was their first string quarterback, now their second string, potentially in Haynes King. Well, it, it would, it, without a doubt, enhance A&M's chances. Uh, there's a reason one guy's the first team and another guy's the second team. And, oh, by the way, that first team were – just happened to win the Heisman Trophy, so uh, yeah, that that would make your chances better. Uh, it's not like Alabama's not going to be able to move the football. A uh, and M run defense has been uh, erratic. I think that's a, a, a safe way to put it. I mean, teams have have run on them. So uh, if Appalachian State can run on you, I don't know why Alabama wouldn't. Uh, but maybe. Uh, Maybe if it's Jalen Milrow, Alabama's offense becomes more one-dimensional. And if that's the case, maybe you feel like you can do more uh, in run defense than you've done before. But uh, I think you're you know, assuming quite a bit. And then you also have to remember that Jalen Milrow's a heck of a runner. He showed that against Arkansas, and some running quarterbacks have had some success. You know, uh, K.J. Jefferson, for instance, you know, he ran the ball pretty, pretty well. So um, – yeah, it would enhance A and M's chances if Mill Rose the starting quarterback, but A and M's still going to have to uh, going to have to play a much better defensive game than they played uh, than they've shown this this year. And I know they haven't given up a lot of touchdowns and things like that. Like I said, on the surface, it looks like A and M's playing great defense, but they're going to have to play much better uh, to have a chance, to, uh, even with Jalen Mill Rose if he's the starter. Tony Olin, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate you. At Academy Sports and Outdoors, bikes for the whole family are just a click away. Buy online at academy.com with our free in-store assembly. 
Your next set of wheels, plus helmets, pads, and water bottles will be waiting for you at our in-store pickup counter. Get to the fun faster with our in-store pickup and free assembly at Academy Sports and Outdoors. All right, our big guest of the week is Pete Futek from collegefootballnews.com, one of the best out there, always breaks it down. Welcome to the show, man. How you been? I'm doing all right. This is fun. You know, I know not for you guys necessarily, but this has been a, a crazy weird season, especially in the SEC West. And man, I mean, there's no shortage of storylines here going forward, especially with what's coming this weekend. Yeah, man. So, all right, I've, I've been around a lot of negativity when it comes to the a program recently, because obviously they're not living up to the perceived standard and the perceived level of excellence that everybody expected this year, at least here internally. So I ask you, Give me a reason for optimism for A&M to shock the world again against Bama. Is there some reason for optimism? Have you seen anything? How about the, you know, that Arkansas had them? You know, there was that moment where it, all of a sudden they did this two years in a row where Alabama looked great to start the game. Arkansas started to roar back. And just when it was 28-23, it was like all of a sudden in Alabama realized, oh, yeah, we're Alabama. Like, we're going to do that. And then game over with a couple of Jameer Gibbs runs in that Milro run. Uh, but Alabama is not, it's not this be all end all team that everyone's making it out to be. It's certainly great. It's probably, it could certainly win the national championship, but this is not Nick Saban's best team. And if Bryce Young's hurt, that's a different team. Of course, Milro is dangerous, uh, but you've got enough of a defense that can kind of keep that backfield in check. And if you're going to make Milro try to throw or even Bryce Young try to throw, the wide receivers aren't there. They don't have the Jamison Williams. They don't have the Jerry Judys and Devontae Smith. They don't, they don't have that normal superstar level of wide receiver that they normally have. And one more part of this is just the Texas A&M style. Look, I mean, for bad, A&M, I, what's the stat? I think they're last in the nation in some offensive category, like, you know, of some sort. But that's because they grind things down to a halt. And it's not good if you get a lead on them and you have to make things a shootout. But on the flip side, they're going to control the tempo of this game. If you keep it within the 20s and not make it some crazy, you know, up and down shootout, yeah, the pressure's all on the other side. No one's expecting AM to do anything in this. So it's all on the other side of the field in this game in terms of how tight that's going to get if the game gets uh, as close longer and longer in. Are you surprised how inefficient on the offensive side AM has been this year? No, I, and I am the, I am one and I'm, I, I see what's coming. I see next year and the year after with these recruiting classes, at least the talent's going to be there where this is going to get better, but you don't have the offensive weapons now, especially without, you know, Neil Smith around, especially without the, you know, you don't have the quarterback play in place. You just don't have the skill guys compared to the rest of the, uh, the SEC at the moment. But you got the infrastructure, you got the lines, you got enough of a defense. So I, I was not shocked that the offense is not exploding like it really should. Because, again, that's not necessarily the style that, that's been working for A&M. It wasn't the style for a while after uh, the uh, Jameis era was over uh, at Florida State under Jimbo Fisher. So eventually that's going to come around. But in a game like this, yeah, they can grind this down to a nub and keep it close and let's see what happens late. How cool is this uh, Kansas TCU game? The fact that, you know, TCU, some people thought left for dead. Kansas, a team that, you know, I know they beat Texas last year, but nobody expected what they've been able to do so far. Now they get game day. Give me the tough, uh, give me the easy out in the, uh, in the big 12. I mean, if Kansas is all of a sudden pretty good, it, it's crazy, but like technically Texas might be like the fifth or sixth best team at the moment. I mean, it's, I mean, West Virginia, is that your worst team? Texas tech. I mean, all 10 teams in that conference now are a problem. And Kansas, you know, they screwed us up because, okay, we got Kansas. All right, they're going to – they're winning games, but they're winning them 55-52. They have no defense, but they have a fun offense. Lance Leipold's one of the best coaches going. And then they go out there and win a, a slugfest against Iowa State. So they've been versatile, versatile enough to hang. TCU's always been one of those programs. When it was under Gary Patterson, one year it just didn't quite work. Then they fixed the glitch, and then everything starts to kick in. Lots of injuries last year. They're healthy this year and rested. They've only played four games and it's been spread out. Uh, we'll see now. We'll see just how real Kansas is. I'm having a hard time still buying in. Uh, I kind of like TCU more in this. But, yeah, that is a crazy thing in a Big 12. It's gotten a whole lot better, a lot faster. 
a game that I think is pretty big that not a lot of people are talking about Tennessee LSU. Um, what yep. this could mean for Brian Kelly, and really what it can mean for, for Tennessee, who's a team that people think, yeah, they're good, but can they keep it going? I keep saying if, if LSU had played, I, who'd they, 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 who was their week two game? They played someone like Southern or McNeese State or one of those, you know, some FCS team uh, in week two. If you, if you flip it around, if they were able to start the season, which I think every team should do, with the FCS team, they just weren't sharp against Florida State. You could see it. That just, that just looked like a team that needed a game or two just to kind of get their sea legs under them and, and just kind of get going. If they had that one warm-up game first, they beat Florida State, and we're talking a whole different animal here with LSU. They're not there yet talent-wise compared to the Alabamas and the Georgias, the SEC, but they have the, they've the they got guys there. They've got the lines. They've got the ability. They're just going to kind of keep going along. Personally, I don't like Brian Kelly from a whole slew of things and from his time at Notre Dame, but that is one good football coach. I mean, you're, the guy's the winningest football coach in the history of Notre Dame. He went to two college football playoffs and a national championship game, got trucked in all three, but still he got him there. He knows what he's doing. So he's a good coach with a good base of talent and not a lot of pressure because no one's expecting them to win the SEC championship this year. And then on the flip side, Tennessee, they're rested. Let's see what you got. No defense, all offense. This is what you wanted to see if you're a Vols fan or Josh Heupel. You've got your plan. You've got a team now that's going to be fun. It's exciting. And then Hooker is still one of the most underappreciated quarterbacks in college football. This is going to be one of those moments when we see if t- Tennessee's for real or if LSU really is going to be a player in this whole thing. All right, so there's the uh, the Aggie in me that thinks this Arkansas-Mississippi State game needs to go one way, and that's Mississippi State trucking them, uh, even though they've already lost LSU. But how do you see yeah. this game going? I, I, again, this is going to be at, at any given week in the SEC West. We know what Auburn is. Auburn's never going to score, but if, you know, so there's your one relatively easy out. But good luck any trying to figure out anybody else because this is this is almost like NFL where you know any game, including AM Alabama to a certain extent, you're it, you're not shocked. I mean, obviously a 20-something point favorite, you're shocked, but you wouldn't be like completely floored if AM did this. And same with this. I mean, Mississippi State, Arkansas, Arkansas, again, another one of those teams that built itself up under Sam Pittman. They've got the offensive defensive lines. You've got a really strong quarterback in K.J. Jefferson. You've got everything else quite there to just be this close to being really good. And this is the first time Mike Leach has had a, a, an amazing defense. He's never had this talent at Texas Tech or Washington State. And he's got a veteran quarterback who knows what he's doing. And so as long as that little dink and dunk passing game can control the game, yeah, I think Mississippi State's going to control this and win it. All right, last one for you. Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, can both of them lose? I'm kidding, but <laughs> Texas has been close yeah. in these games. Oklahoma, when they've lost, they've royally lost. And it's one of those rivalries where the team that's that's not supposed to win ends up kind of showing up because that is a pressure game. And we know how soft Texas can be at times, at least over the last few years as a program. Uh, and Oklahoma, as bad as it's looked over the last few weeks, let's see how Dylan Gabriel is, see if he's, you know, see what the quarterback situation is going to be like. But that's just one of those series where the underdog always seems to rise up and play just a little bit better under the pressure. I kind of like Oklahoma getting points in this, but that is going to be that, that's a moment where if you're Steve Sarkeesian, you've got to win this game because, you know, if you're Texas, you, you came that close against Alabama, you already lost to Texas Tech. You can't lose to Oklahoma at this point. PFU Tech, thanks so much, brother. I'll, I'll talk to you on your show this weekend, my man. I'm looking forward to it. We, we need your help. We need you to elevate the game of our show, and you're going to certainly be able to do that for us. We'll bring it, man. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great rest of the week. All right, we're rolling through here on up to the second college football, the Red River Showdown coming up, Texas and Oklahoma. While both teams do have two losses, there's a little difference. Oklahoma just got trounced by 31 points. That was an embarrassing loss. But Texas, they've got two losses on the year, but by a combined four points. So they feel really good about things, which is annoying. Just kidding. We're welcomed by uh, one half of the No Lay Apes crew, my buddy Rohil Ramzanali, who breaks down all things college football, but he does keep a special attention to his horns. What's going on, buddy? Hey, not much, man. Uh, it's been an interesting season so far. And like I looked up and I'm going, what? It's already here. OU week is already here. Usually they have a bye week before this game to get ready. And nope, not this year. We're rolling right into it. And the season is just rolling, you know, it's just rolling around. And it's like, what? We're already, what? what is this? Why? Why are we here so fast? 
So it's interesting because I look at Texas and I feel like this team's made progress, but then they have made these they make these mistakes. You're like, you know, not saying that losing at Texas Tech is necessarily an embarrassment, embarrassing, but you feel like they, they they do so well against Alabama, then they take two steps back against Tech. Who is the real Texas team? Do you even know? That's that's the that's the hundred million dollar question right now. Who is this team? Right, the Texas Tech game. You had the lead. You had that game in the bag. You went there, and it looked like getting your first road win in the Big 12, beating Texas Tech in their big Super Bowl because Texas will never be back over there, and you know nobody they're not going to sell out again. So you had that game. You lived up to the intensity of the crowd and ready to get out of there, and then you had the second half collapse. And we've seen this from the Longhorns, right? You see them play great for the first two quarters, three quarters, and then there's a collapse, a la Alabama, the fourth quarter. And that is the thing that Sark needs to clean up. We've seen the stats from all the you know reporters that are covering the Longhorns team. All the losses, you see the Horns are doing, taking care of business. They're doing what they need to, and then they have a collapse. So the real Horns right now are, this is a great team that starts off awesome, and they don't make the adjustments. And to see them hold on against West Virginia to, you know, they came out strong, they held on to the lead, and they look good the entire time was refreshing. But again, that's a West Virginia team that, you know, they're not as good as an Alabama, of course. They might not be as good as Texas Tech. So now the real challenge is can you hold up the entire four quarters against Oklahoma, something that you haven't done in previous games, and that's going to be a major test. So a couple of weeks back, we would have thought, you know, Texas is on the way down, Oklahoma's on the way up, and now uh, Oklahoma's on the way down. Do you see this game as like Texas like putting a beating on OU, or because of this robbery, the nature of these games, you just never know what game you're going to get? You just never know, right? Last year, remember, horns come out, guns ablaze, and you're like, this is going to be a blowout, and they lose. And they gave up another major lead, right? So you just don't know in these rivalry games. And we won't know. Like, yeah, Oklahoma is down right now. Maybe they turn things around with this win, right? And we'll see in the end of the season uh, rankings who really, you know, who is Oklahoma, who is Texas. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't predict a blowout in this game just because of the rivalry. Now, Texas's defense has been much better this season. And you look at the losses, you look at the wins. They're doing a great job of holding teams under 27 points. I know against Texas Tech, they gave up 34, but that was because of the fumble, and that's overtime right there. So, you know, you have to take that into account. But they've done a good job of holding teams to where they need to be, and the offense needs to live up to that, and we'll see what happens with OU. Hey, so uh, when we look at this team and what Quinn Ewers was able to do in a very small sample set, what, what, what can he do when healthy? Is that still a TBD? And what are you hearing about his health? So the health, it looks like, you know, it marks up to he should be playing against Oklahoma. And Hudson Card's been nice. Like he, He's done a good job of filling in and, you know, making plays when needed. But he's not Quinn Ewers, right? He, that small sample size, Texas fans will always remember. Going up in that first quarter against Alabama, challenging that secondary, not afraid to throw against them. And just the ball looks so different in that second game compared to that first game of the season where it was his first action in almost three years. So the expectations for him are to continue that. And who knows if that'll be the case, but just having him back there changes everything, right? From a, from, from a game planning perspective, from having more plays in the playbook that you can use and just using those weapons that are on the outside. So I think he will play this weekend and I think he's going to just pick up where he left off. Raheel, I'm going to ask you a Texas A&M question, um, and I'm sure a joke is coming from your end, but um, I'll, I'll still ask it. Give me a reason to believe A&M can beat Bama this weekend. Uh, because you work there. Because I love Billy Lucci. I love David Nuno. I love your whole staff. Um, that's probably the only reason. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm, ru I'm running low on reasons. Well, I, I, I'm going to counter that because okay. A&M has done it already. Okay, They did it a year ago. And, I, and yeah. I'm not saying that I'm predicting them to win at the moment. I'm not saying that at all because A&M hasn't figured out their offense yet. But they, they did find their offense in that game last year for some strange reason at Kyle Field. Different when you go to Tuscaloosa. Yeah. I get it. And, and also because something about Bama. I know they looked great against Arkansas, even with like their fifth-string quarterback. It doesn't matter. But I came into the season thinking they weren't as good. Te your Texas team played them to the brink, right, to the very end. 
So what did you see yeah. from the, is this Bama team vulnerable or not? I think it's very vulnerable. Um, I don't think they're the best team in the nation by any stretch. They're not the same old Alabama, right, where they're just rolling and you've got redemption on the mind this year. They haven't looked that good. And I even, you know, we talked after the Texas game and you and I had different opinions on the offensive line for Alabama. I was watching them, you know, like that close. I'm like, wow, these guys are huge. And they did a good job in the fourth quarter protecting Bryce Young, making sure there was no pressure from the Texas defense, something they didn't do in the first three quarters, and they really tightened up. Now, I haven't watched them as tightly since that game, I'll be honest with you, but I think they're a very beatable team, and I think a and has the talent. They have the motivation now coming off the loss, and look, everyone's counting a and out, and yeah, the, the confidence is there. Like, it's, Alabama's not this untouchable Alabama. Right. They're, they're they have openings that you can take advantage of. And that could be the the battle cry there for Jimbo and company. And look, again, when you have a team against, uh, you know, you got their backs against the wall and nothing else. Everyone's counting them out. I don't want to play that team. And we've seen a and come back from those situations. Yeah. Hey, good stuff for Hill. We appreciate it. I know it's a busy week for you. Thanks so much for joining us, man. Absolutely, man. Good luck this weekend. And gosh, I love that Jimbo extension. One more extension. See, I was going to let you I had go. I think get one shot in. Come on. I had to get one shot in. Hey, you know what? I, you, what I love is that uh, you guys go five and seven and think, oh, Sark has figured it out. You're on track for that again, buddy. Why is this so awkward? Why is there awkward silence? Oh, because you broke up. You got to say it one more time. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not going to say it again. That's not how it works. My audience. No, no, no. You're, you literally broke up. I'm so sorry. Wait, Come on. I got to hear this. I, what? R- Raheel? I, I lost him. I, I, no. Where'd he go? Nick, what happened to Rio? I don't hear him. I don't see him. I don't hear him. Oh, too bad. See you next time. <laughs> see ya. <laughs> Later, buddy. Need a new grill? Academy Sports and Outdoors is the destination for your outdoor cooking needs. With our free in-store assembly and pre-assembled grills and smokers, buy online at academy.com and pick up in-store. So keep those grilling plants at Academy Sports and Outdoors. All right, with me now, I have got Dogs247, Jordan Hill, to talk a little bit of the Georgia-Auburn matchup this weekend. Jordan, how you doing? Doing great. Uh, just ready for what for Georgia is the first rivalry week of the season. It's always a fun time and excited to see what happens Saturday. Yeah, the Deep South rivalry. So we've got to talk about Georgia. The last two weeks, it's been uh, – kind of surprising to see the scores that they've come up with with Kent State and Missouri. So what do you think that the Bulldogs are struggling with right now? What's going on? Yeah, you know, it's it's been a very interesting two games because you look two weeks ago against Kent State, you sort of think, well, you know, you're playing a MAC team. Maybe they kind of sleptwalk. And also it was a noon game. Maybe it's a situation where you just kind of sleepwalk. Then you go on the road and play a Missouri team that was coming off a really rough loss to Auburn. And it was struggles much like we saw against Kent State. You know, the two things that really stand out to me from those two games that popped up in both games were turnovers. Uh, This is a Georgia team that started the year. First three games did not turn the ball over one single time. Last two weeks have had at least two turnovers in both of those games. And I think that that really hurt them. I think it kind of threw things off, particularly those turnovers. The majority of them happened in the first half. I think it was sort of a situation where both times the offense sort of turned around and was like, I mean, it kind of uh, discombobulated what they were trying to do. And I think that was a big problem. The biggest problem Saturday against Missouri was just the offensive line. They could get no push, particularly in the run game. Kirby Smart didn't mince his words about it afterwards, said we just got whipped up front, which is, you know, we don't see a whole lot with a Georgia team that's full of four stars and five stars, particularly up front. Um, so it's definitely two very interesting results to see uh, sort of the struggles that we didn't really anticipate, especially after the, the way they opened the season, beating Oregon in the fashion they did. Um, but a lot of intrigue going into this game to see if Georgia can kind of snap out of these last two weeks and, and try to return to form as a team that some people think could be the best in the nation. Yeah, and you said that you think they may have just gone into these games almost asleep. So do you think these two games were a bit of a wake-up call for the Bulldogs? I really think more the Missouri game than the Kent State game, because even with that Kent State game, they were mostly up two touchdowns. You never really thought being at that game, oh, they could lose. Uh, That was a very different story than it was in Columbia Saturday night. I mean, Harrison Mevis hits a 56-yard field goal, 
and I was there at the game. I was in the press box, and I after he hit that, I thought Georgia's going to lose this game. And and credit to the Bulldogs, credit to guys like Stetson Bennett, guys like Dejon Edwards, guys like Kenny McIntosh. They desperately needed to move the ball, um, and, and they did in the final probably eight minutes of that game. Offensive line that again, as Kirby Smart had said, had been getting whipped throughout the game really stepped up. I mean, really opened some holes for the running backs and they found a way to win. And as ugly as that was, and I know a lot of Georgia fans were not thrilled by that performance. There are going to be situations where great teams run into uh, teams that, uh, you know, came in knowing what the, the kind of competition they were playing. Um, and, and Georgia had a really off night, but when you can have an off night and still win, you know, that separates good teams from great teams. And this is an opportunity for this team to learn from that. And now play an Auburn team that, you know, had a, a good first half against LSU and then wasn't able to do anything in the second half. This is a very good opportunity for Georgia to kind of have a get right game, um, but it's not going to be a, a gimme. They have to show up and be ready to play. So how do you think that Georgia's defense can go about neutralizing Auburn's quarterback, Robbie, Roby Ash? Robbie Ashford, he is a dual threat, and he seems to work really well under pressure. The The biggest thing with Robbie Ashford and trying to slow him down is going to be just staying patient because I think he's going to scramble from time to time. Really, the biggest plays that Auburn was able to make against LSU came on what you know became scrambles where Robbie Ashford, who really talented guy. I mean, Kerry Smart talked about him on Monday and said he was a guy that Georgia recruited way back when, when he was at uh, Hoover High School over there in Alabama. Uh, but it's just a situation where you have to understand he's probably going to make a few plays uh, over the course of this game. I wouldn't be surprised if Auburn is able to spring some explosive plays, but you just have to limit those. You, you cannot allow him – uh, to throw you off, you can't allow him to really get comfortable. You know, if Georgia's able to come after him, especially, um, it's going to be a tall task just because of how athletic he is. But Georgia's probably going to be playing without Jalen Carter, who, you know, a lot of people think could be a top five pick in next April's draft. Um, so they have to make him uncomfortable. They have to take advantage if he does make mistakes. Kind of the turning point in that LSU loss for Auburn was a fumble that Robbie Ashford had that got returned for a touchdown. And that was sort of, when the momentum really shifted and LSU kind of took that game over, uh, if those opportunities present themselves on Saturday, Georgia has to take advantage or it could be another four-quarter game. So what facet of this game coming up do you see this matchup being the strongest in? I think the biggest thing that is going to tell if Auburn is going to keep this close, which, I mean, I've seen a few different lines. I think uh, Georgia might be something like a four-touchdown favorite. If Auburn's offensive line gets pushed around, it's not going to be a very close game. Auburn has struggled to move the ball. They were really exploited in the Penn State loss. They just weren't able to get any kind of push, and Penn State's defenders pretty much lived in the Auburn backfield. They have got to shore things up if they're going to be able to, even again, if Jalen Carter's not able to play, Georgia still has plenty of talent. Michael Williams, Nazir Stackhouse, some of those players are going to feast on a really rough Auburn offensive line. And then uh, sort of on the other side, it's going to be if Georgia can really shake off what was a shaky performance of the offensive line against Missouri against an Auburn defensive line that has playmakers, but is coming off a really tough, a tough loss in the fact that Eku Leota, one of their best edge rushers, uh, is out. They think he might miss the rest of the season. He's definitely going to miss this game on Saturday. Uh, if Georgia can impose its will as far as the offensive line, um, it could be a situation by uh, the end of the third quarter. It's pretty clear that Georgia's moving on to another win. All right. Thanks so much for joining us, Jordan. We will catch you on the next one. Sounds great. Appreciate it. All right, Kennedy, that's going to do it for the show. Thanks to Academy Sports and Outdoors. What was your favorite part of the show? I loved talking with Jonathan Wells. That was a fun conversation. What did you like about Jonathan Wells? Um, I love that he is getting back to his roots, connecting back into the Texans community. I, I'm a Houstonian, so I'm a Texans fan by blood. So really hoping that in the next few years, the program sees a little shift. Yeah, and uh, I think all of our guests were great. So thank you so much for watching. She's Kennedy. I'm still David. We will see you, or she's Lavernia, sorry. We'll see you next time here on Up to the Second College Football, presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Thank you. Bye.